I'm Barman Williams. We're back with the Small Prince, and today my guest is Dan Fajella, and I'll let him introduce himself. Dan, how do you like to be introduced? Uh, uh, I'm not too fancy. Uh, I'm, I'm the CEO and founder of Emerge Artificial Intelligence Research. We focus on what's possible and what's working uh, with artificial intelligence, and we speak for big organizations like the UN and, and the OECD and, and work for big banks and pharmaceutical firms in terms of helping them mold artificial intelligence strategies. So you could think about us like a boutique forester or gartner, but purely with an eye on AI. And so that's what we do. Yeah, so we are gonna be talking about AI, artificial intelligence, for those of you not clued up on it, with Dan today, although taking a bit further away from your, your regular day job, which is informing sort of AI corporate strategy and talking rather a little bit further forward when it comes to future AI policy, when it comes to sort of managing, as Dan likes to say, the post-human transition. That's a lot of big words. So sure let's is. start with that, Dan. What is the post-human transition? Yeah, well, I'm glad we're, get, we're able to riff about this. I, I do think that sometimes these, these notions are purely kind of in sci-fi land, um, but I don't think that we should really leave them relegated in that domain. So the, the broad idea of the post-human transition is the notion that over the course of, whether it's the coming two centuries or the coming 30 years, whatever the case may be, um, uh, neurotechnologies, artificial intelligence, nanotechnologies will, will sort of tippy toe us beyond current human potential. That is to say sort of hominids as they are being the, the preeminent species and sort of the, the sole source of, you know, guidance and order in our, in our world, you know, at least in a conscious sense, right? Nature has its own way of balancing things out. Um, but yeah, the, the post-human transition or the post-human trajectory is kind of the, the, the path in which that intelligence is developing itself. And I think that it'll be molded by many factors, many of which I imagine we'll talk about here, such as um, what kinds of innovations are permitted um, you know, do, are these technologies developed purely in an arms race dynamic, or is there other, some other way of kind of guiding and bending what kind of brain computer interfaces are going to be able to be allowed into people's skulls in the next 50 years, um, and, and where we take artificial intelligence. So that's the, that's the high level. And I think the consequences are grandiose, because if you think about um, sort of, uh, you know, what a, a, a cricket could do or a rodent could do, and then you think about what people can do, you know, here we are with these fancy videos uh, doing all these fancy things. If we think about kind of a similar stepwise up in terms of grand order of magnitude um, lifting in intelligence, I think the moral consequences of that intelligence, we, which we might presume would be whatever would populate the galaxy, um, would be huge. Um, and, and so it, it could be argued that influencing that trajectory is among the most important things. Yeah, so I was supposed to start off with there's sort of two things you got to unpack. One is what is possible and the other one is what is preferable. So in terms of what is possible here at the point that we are right now, certainly from my perspective, and I think that you agree, is that we've passed a point where a lot of this, this transition, whatever sort of, however it plays out, is, is pretty much inevitable. The fact that we sort of perhaps, as, as I was saying to, to Craig on the, the last version of the show, our generation is sort of that last boat out of pure human Saigon, right? Yeah. I mean, like the, the genie is out the bottle here. Would you agree with that in terms of what's possible at this point? It's not a case that we can prevent it. It's more a case of how far can we direct the course from here? Would you agree that, with that or not? I, I would wholeheartedly agree with that. I mean, I think barring nuclear war or, you know, the melting of the ice cap, I, and I don't, I'm not as much of an expert on, you know, nukes and, and the environment as, as with AI, but all of this is prognostication. But I, I would say that, you know, in general, I would very much put my chips where I betting man in, in, in the, uh, you know, in the position that you just articulated there, that we were kind of the last boat out. Um, you know, when I, when I think about the post-human transition, I have a lengthier piece about kind of what are, what, are the, what are the pieces of this trajectory um, and as they, as they shift out? And part of this is the merging of the virtual and the real in, in sort of an indistinguishable way. You know, I, I have a, a brother with a very young daughter who's, you know, I mean, they're great parents and they don't just put her in front of screens all day, but she's really enmeshed with screens from, from the get-go. Um, and, and I think that, you know, where VR is going to be when that kid is seven years old, never mind 17 years old, um, will imply... A, a pretty kind of agnostic position as to virtual or real. You know, you think about it, Bronwyn, you're pretty aware of what we do at Emerge. Um, the vast bulk of what we do is in the virtual world. I mean, especially post COVID, I can't even go to, you know, Paris or Austin, Texas or whatever and give a talk and shake hands. It's all creating virtual stuff. So value is virtual, work is virtual. 
Um, and, and it's not fake virtual, like, well, it's virtual, but it's not really real. No, it's, it's quite real. It's actually how we get paid around here. It's actually how we deliver value to enterprises around here. Um, it, it's, it's, uh, it's real. And so, um, you know, I remember the transition of going online, like, ooh, isn't this neat? You probably do as well, Bronwyn. But of course, uh, people 10 years younger than us, never mind, you know, kids born two years ago, um, will have almost no distinction at all. And I think that the blurring of those lines and the agnosticism around, is it real, is it virtual, is part of the tippy-toeing process of us turning into something else. Yeah, exactly. And I suppose the turning into something else, there's a few conversations to be had. Our last show over here, we did talk about sort of genetic engineering and the sort of biological enhancements of humanity. We're going to leave that one alone for today and rather talk about the sort of artificial enhancements of humanity or of alternative intelligences, because that's more sort of your domain of expertise. Yeah. And I suppose that's the sort of next question in terms of where we headed from here. There are various different sort of divergent thoughts there, different thought leaders, different people that have worked in different academic institutions, different sort of tech sort of leaders across the world all have kind of different ideas as to where we're heading. But the, the sort of basic ideas that come out of that is either that we end up enhancing ourselves and taking control of our own destiny by merging human intelligence with sort of more sort of technological enhancements. So the, the sort of classic example there is sort of cheesy as it is, as old Elon Musk in his sort of brain chips. Sure, sure. The other one is that, of course, that artificial intelligence takes on a, a sort of artificial life of its own, to put it that way, and evolves to be something that's intelligent, but not human at all. So what are your thoughts on those two, those two prongs, those two, which, which is more likely to happen and <laughs> which yeah. is more desirable? Well, um, yeah, the desirable conversation gets pretty challenging, but I, I think that um, both of those trajectories seem rather viable. Um, and, and we've done a number of polls with um, AI PhDs around these topics. We'll take 30 folks, you know, from uh, Oxford Future Humanity Institute to Duke University to you name it, um, and, and just kind of gather ideas around things like, you know, by when might you suspect machines to be sentient in the same way that, let's say, some kind of a lower mammal is. Um, and, you know, we saw some confluence in, in the 2050, 2065 range or something like that. But of course, this is all prognostication. If you ask people 100 years ago, when are we going to have flying cars, you know, they'd say in 40 years. So I, I can't give too much weight to these things. But what I will say is um, it seems rather viable that some level of brain computer interface will um, uh, will become part of our near term future and that AI will become stronger and more generally capable in a way where it, it might take on a life of its own. So I would say both of those are trajectories to keep an eye on. I consider them essentially to be the main trajectories. I think that um, genetic alteration and kind of nanotech is, is likely to go along with brain computer interface. We need, we might need those sciences to develop in order to, to jack in properly. But I suspect that the greater developments and faster developments will, will come on the digital side rather than the biological side. Um, so yeah, so I think they're both viable. In terms, of, in terms of preferable, where would you like me to go on that? There's so many interesting directions to, to head off on this, uh, this conversation. I wanna, I wanna go somewhere you want. Yeah, so I suppose maybe we, can, maybe we come back to that in a second. Sure. Is in that both of those journeys, from my perspective, is they both kind of the same one, right? So both of them involve sort of escaping, as you like to say, the sort of flawed human vessel that we have. So either it's our own creation that sort of runs off and sort of lives the next life without us, in which case it's still something that's been birthed out of humanity, yeah. or we manage to sort of jump out of our sort of human skins into some sort of an artificial consciousness. It's, a, it's the same sort of process, right? So it's transcending, taking who we are, the best of our, our mind and our ability and our ability to build things and transcending the, the human experience. So I suppose that comes back to your sort of views on what is preferable in that. I know you have written quite extensively about our flesh and blood human bodies being yeah. quite irreparably flawed. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think, um, you know, it, it's, it is patently obvious that, you know, our our current forms, I mean, in so much as we can tell, kind of bubbled out of the arbitrary processes of, of evolution, which is perfectly fine. I'm happy I'm not a rabbit. I'm happy I'm not an earthworm. Like it's, it's not a bad shake, you know, all things considered. Um, but, but it's certainly a fettered vehicle. Um, you know, you and I can understand all kinds of neat and complicated things, um, but you know, our dogs or cats can't really understand, uh, you know, Shakespeare's sonnets or Emerson's poems or, or uh, 
you know, democracy versus Marxism or, or you name it. And similarly, there are all kinds of thoughts that just like those animals are incapable of thinking that, that you and I are incapable of thinking. There's senses that we can't take in. Um, there's ideas that we can't possibly imagine, never mind articulate. Um, and so we're missing out on large swaths, you know, arguably the vast bulk of, of um, what the world actually is, of being in touch with things as, as they are. We might be a, a hair closer to that than a cricket uh, who, who might have absolutely no clue uh, sort of what's going on, at least in the same way that we do. Um, like they wouldn't know that a building is a hospital. They wouldn't know, you know, what an airplane is. They wouldn't. Um, but, but similarly, there's, there's the, the broad swath of the world that we don't understand. And also it's, it's patently clear that um, to, to me, a part of the trajectory, the pull into the post-human here is the fact that um, we aren't satisfied. Like this vehicle is uh, not optimized for well-being. And, and sort of the hedonic treadmill of always wanting more, I think is really, it's, it's, a, it's, pro, it's, it's probably what's brought us here. I mean, civilization, you know, language, who knows? I mean, our, our perpetual dissatisfaction on some level has spurred us to become what we are. Um, but I don't think any of us particularly like uh, pain and suffering all that much um, or, or, the, or the amount or, or preponderance of it that exists uh, for us humans, never mind for you know, the bulk of the living world, 51% of which are parasites, you know, some huge swath of which will die being eaten alive, kicking and screaming. And if you think about that at scale, everything from tiny, tiny things up to, you know, elephants, it's a pretty rough general shebang we got going on here in the Darwinian world. And so I think that um, the trajectory into the transcending you refer to, um, I believe is, is going to be um, driven in large part by our desire for well-being. And so I think initially we're going to go into virtual worlds or, or aim for kind of um, uh, technologically facilitated experiences that we think will fulfill us, but we'll find out very, very swiftly. And I'm surprised it's not part of the common discourse right now, that it is the vessel itself that is flawed, as Lucretius said, and as you uh, quoted kindly there. Um, it is the vessel itself that is flawed, that no matter what kinds of virtual experiences or foods or whatever is pumped into us, um, our, our condition is such, our hardware and software are such that um, fulfillment just isn't, isn't accessible. And I think that that will, that will promote a good deal of that back of the dome game uh, that, that I suspect is gonna occur over the course of the next three to four decades. Um, well, listening to what you're saying, I mean, where we are right now, where we are at this sort of this point that we already sort of leaped off into that we, something is going to transcend what we understand is a human being right now. From, if we listen to what you're saying, it seems to be that you would be saying that we shouldn't resist this, that we should actually try and, and go with it. Because resisting it just sort of traps us in our sort of mortal cycles of suffering and death, which has kind of been yeah, the, sort yeah. of the, the messy history of what humanity and in fact life in general on planet Earth is. So that would be a view. So that, of course, is a subject to view. I'm sure there are other people listening to this who are quite horrified at, at going along with any sort of post-human sure, transition. Sure, yeah. But just making that point that it seems to be from your perspective that if the vessel is flawed, we should be encouraging and going along with something that can, can transcend us. We don't perpetuate cycles of suffering and death like we've had before. Is that an accurate way to, to phrase your position? I appreciate you letting me clarify a little bit. That's you're 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 really touching on important things here. Um, number one, you know that there is kind of a, a spooky like uh, b pseudo religious ish element to 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 all this stuff that I try to steer as clear from as I can. Um, but I do think it's interesting that you know the world's religions, you know, the veil of tears in Christianity, and you know, uh, overcoming suffering in Buddhism and whatnot, and and just just how much of it is about sort of the same story of of sort of the here being, you know, suffering and, and the, the, the goal being kind of the transcendence thereof. And by golly, ain't it the goal. And, um, and it's, it's, why, it's why we done built civilizations and whatnot. It's why we done built technologies and whatnot. It's gonna be why we done build the future technologies as well. Um, and uh, so um, certainly I think that uh, I, I've never advocated, and in fact, you know, you could go through everything on danpagella.com blog-wise for the last eight years and, and really never find any um, eager, wholehearted, foolhardy pursuit of just bring on the robots, jack in the brains to the computers. Like, I, I, I'm not a rushing, I, I don't advocate a rush, but I do advocate that if it be inevitable, and it is, um, you know, form is just dissipating or turning into other forms, to think that what's a happy billion year from now future to just imagine hairless monkeys like me and you 
maybe with like better iPhones, like eating fancier foods or something, like would be an absolutely absurd billion year goal. Never mind million year goal. Um, in my personal opinion, I just don't think, I don't think it's the height of objectives that we could take. That doesn't mean let's all experiment wildly and dangerously with, with AGI and, and with, with brain computer interface by any means. So, so um, I advocate that if, if this be a, a transition that we, we can't necessarily stop, and I, I think that's the case, then ought we think about maybe, number one, I, I talk about the two questions, you know, what do we ultimately want to become and how do we get there without destroying ourselves? Can we at least contemplate these things, talk about them? And maybe the result isn't rush and jack in our domes. Maybe that's not the, the, the resulting decision. Maybe the decision is um, certain sort of uh, steering committees around certain technologies, certain assessments of certain risks, certain kind of tippy toes in certain directions. Maybe that's where we end up. Um, but I, so, so I don't advocate rushing, but I do think that um, if it's going to happen, then we might as well answer the two questions and try to make some progress as, as a species. Uh, yeah. But yeah. So, so admitting that we can do better is, of course, one thing. Getting to that better place or having it all end up happening after oh, yeah. is, a, is an entirely different question. And that's, that's sort of where I'm leading to with the, sort of the, the different questions I've taken you through there. So if we can admit that we can do better than our flawed human condition, and if we do admit that that might require letting go a bit of what we understand to be human in its current guise is, then at least we can open up the conversation as to how to sort of steer that transition across what we currently understand to be a homo sapien, if you want to use all Harari's whole thing of homo deus to the sort yeah, of yeah, next yeah. level up. Yeah then at least we can have the conversation as to how we can do that better and avoid disaster. And I think that that's, that's where I am. I'm probably a little bit, a little bit sort of behind your way of thinking in my current place in the world. I think it comes from sort of living in quite a chaotic society in South Africa. Right. We do yeah, seem yeah, to yeah. Have, a, have, a, have a shorter sort of time preference as to, as to what's going on. But I think where we do meet is an understanding that the choices that we make now are going to determine whether this transition, which is one way or another, some way sort of inevitable, either through sort of disaster or through, through transcendence, it, whether it's directed or whether it is chaotic and full of devastating conflict. And we have to start making the choices now because so much of the, so many of these horses have already bolted. So many of the, of the dyes are already being cast. cast yeah, I think yeah, that so yeah. many of these, these conversations that we have that sound very science fiction-y and very sort of, oh, it's not my problem. It's very futuristic. I think we miss out on a lot of the urgency and just how important this is, particularly from a political and policy perspective right now just how immense this transition is and i think we've sort of alluded to that a bit today and just how big the stakes are but also what we're missing out on is how many of those positions are already being staked out in the world we have around us today and you started speaking earlier about how we're sort of virtualizing our lives we spend so much more time in virtual environments but who controls those virtual environments who creates the rules who is setting up to be the players whether they are nations or whether they are platforms or companies that are already in some ways marking out the stakes as to how this transition is going to play out. And I know you have thoughts in this area, so I'll, I'll leave it there and I'll let you jump in with, with sure. your thoughts to follow on from there. Yeah, yeah. I, I have, you know, if I just look at the momentum of the world at present, and I don't, I'm not actually all that interested in science fiction Personally, I, I, I read some modern thinkers like, you know, the Bostroms and Nayef al-Rodan and some of the other Future Humanity Institute guys like Stuart uh, Armstrong and whatnot. But, um, but I'm not interested in fiction. I, I read a lot of history and then I spend all day talking to head of AI Raytheon, you know, VP of AI Comcast, you know, uh, just unicorn company founders and whatnot. And, and, and just sort of casting the present trends forward, it seems to me as though the big game here at present um, is that, you know, we are going in, you know, the great virtual escape, if you will, if we look at, you know, percent spent, percent of time spent on screens or in virtual worlds 20 years ago versus now, it's completely night and day, Com amount of value created in virtual worlds then and now completely night and day. Um, again, the entirety of what, what I do for a living, it just only exists in ones and zeros. I, I don't think I've ever, maybe somebody's printed out our research. I, I don't print it and send it to anybody. Um, so, it, it, uh, and, and the vast bulk of the interviews have been, you know, facilitated through technology, like we're, what we're doing now. So the great virtual escape, we're, we're going in. And, and my suspicion here is that 
um, because of our, our own human drives, we're going to want these virtual environments to fulfill more and more of our needs. Don't they already, though? I mean, I make my living on this interweb. Um, you know, what 50 people, 50% 50 of people in America, you know, meet their future spouse on the interweb. Uh, like, what, what do those numbers look like 20 years ago, right? Um, and, and uh, you know, I, I push a button and, and, you know, I've got like frozen spinach, you know, at the front door in six hours. That's a human need. So the virtual is, is increasingly sort of fulfilling more and more uh, of, of what we need in our lives. And, um, and we're going to be spending more and more time in virtual environments as, as VR becomes more immersive. Um, that will be able to fulfill even more desires. At some point, I won't have, you know, glass and metal screen like this. I'll have something on my face. I'll have as many displays of as many kinds as I'd like with beautiful background of, you know, mountain peaks in the Swiss Alps or, or you know, the inside of some glorious castle somewhere, whatever I want as my background, whatever is going to appease my mood or something like that. I'll be able to have a lot more customized, wonderful experience um, to, to, my, to my liking. And I think that this is going to diverge in two ways. I'll drop two more ideas and then we can kind of just get into where you want to pry out from here. I mean, I know you're familiar with a handful of these. So um, one of them is this notion that sort of people are going to go into the virtual world, I think mainly for two reasons. Um, one of which is to sort of escape the state of nature. And one of which is to uh, further compete in the state of nature. Uh, and I don't think actually that there is an escape, but uh, so, but, but we'll get into it. So most people, you know, I, I don't know what the percentages are, but it's like one in eight people in, in America are on some kind of antidepressant. I think in the bulk of some huge bulk of the Western world, it's, it's something similar to that. It's pretty evident that, you know, we're willing to pay for well-being, and most people would just like to take something to feel better. I'm not, I'm not decrying that technology and innovations unto itself, although I won't necessarily say it's always the best step one. Um, but uh, most people are going to go into the virtual world because they would like it to fulfill their needs and kind of forget about the hardships. Um, some, some of the listeners might be familiar with hikikomori in Japan. These are men who, uh, you know, uh, into the age of 30, 40, 50, live with their parents and essentially never go outside and just live entirely in video games and online forums and sort of like pornography and, and whatever. And that's just the life that they've chosen. The world hasn't had as many opportunities for them, the job market, whatever. And so they've decided this is going to be my world. I think that's a portent for a good deal uh, of the first world. And so a lot of people will, will go in and to have their needs fulfilled and kind of forget about the tough, you know, the competition of jobs, competition of mates, competition of the state of nature, right? State of nature is competition. Uh, some, you know, cooperation along the way, but, you know, at the end of the day, we all get it. Um, the other people go in uh, to compete further in the state of nature. It's patently evident now that Google is more powerful than, I don't know, any Eastern European country, um, may maybe Europe, uh, 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 you know, um, no offense to my European friends and everything, but, um, but it's, you know, it, it's patently obvious that, that, uh, these virtual ecosystems and, and these large technology players are, are, this is how power is played. And, you know, as America, you know, as I woefully lament America continuing to invest military dollars into things that rust, I think China is inventing in, uh, investing military dollars into digital technologies and, and ruling the digital infrastructure, which I think is much more imp important than having a lot of tanks and a lot of guys that maintain a lot of tanks. Uh, in a lot of places around the world. And so this is the future of power. And so if you want to wield influence politically, uh, militarily, economically, uh, that, that's going to be the game you play. And here's the final hypothesis. The final hypothesis is that the top of the dominance hierarchy on earth, in so much as I can see it, um, is whoever owns the substrate. So as more and more people live almost entirely in virtual ecosystems, whoever controls the the experience is getting piped into your head. Probably it's going to start here, and then at some point it's going to go here. Whoever's controlling those in and out flows wins the game. And if if you if you have the bulk of humanity um, inside of your virtual ecosystem, if you if you own the substrate, if you if you monopolize the substrate, then you you perma win. You you just it, it's over. And then and then you'll essentially control the entire trajectory of intelligence from there. And so my suspicion, that the substrate hypothesis, uh, substrate monopoly hypothesis. Final note here is that. Um, I believe that in the latter part of the 21st century, all great power conflict, I'm not talking about like whatever Lithuania or Luxembourg does, um, but great powers, um, the, the most powerful companies, most powerful countries, all great power competition, economic, uh, military, or, or political, is, will ultimately be about in the latter part of this century, um, owning, owning the substrate. And so I think that's yeah. the trajectory we're naturally on. 
your thesis definitely maps almost directly onto mine, although I've come to come to these ideas from a, from a different sort of path because I wasn't following AI as being sort of my sort of golden sort of star that I was looking at. Yeah, yeah. I tend to look at things more from like a, from a sort of economic systems point of view. But what I've been speaking about a lot over the last two years is how the future is sort of a combination of, as you mentioned, Japan on the one hand and South Africa on the other, which I think maps very neatly onto what you're trying to describe there. And that is sort of like the Japanese experience, but through a South African sort of neo-feudalism, digital feudalism sort of combination. So when you sort of combine uh -huh. the inequality of South Africa and the fact that you have very few hands controlling and at the moment, real resources, but increasingly digital resources, yeah. which is where stores of values lie, combined with the sort of Japanese digital experience, you kind of see how technology is replacing a lot of the human experiences, but at the same time, those same sort of dynamics playing out across broader society in terms of inequality, in terms of, as I term them, walled gardens, you term them as sort of substrates. You yeah. know, there's people that own the territory and there's other people that essentially lease the territory. So you can call them digital landlords, you can call them substrate landlords, you can call it sort of owning that space, which yeah. people currently do in the, in the physical world, those same ownership patterns translate into the digital sphere. But where it becomes more extraordinary, which just sort of builds on your thesis there, is that the digital sphere is, is borderless which also maps onto what's happening in the world of cryptography and all the cryptocurrencies, which is exactly the same dynamic playing out in that the people that own the system have outsized power over people that are outside of the system. And essentially you've seen these sort of world gardens that are connecting real resources because we do still have our flawed vessels, as yeah. you say, someone's got to deliver the food to the hikikomori's house for him to yeah, eat, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and the, so the, the people, when, when the, sort of the ownership over real resources maps quite nicely over the ownership of digital resources, you can sort of see how the sort of neo-feudal digital lords of the future have this complete sort of control over mind, body, and spirit of the sort of the, the future sort of rollouts of society. And increasingly to sort of pick up on your points that you were saying earlier, that whole thing of like, why are people going all in? Why do hikikomori exist and all that? It's because our sort of our hearts are where our treasure lies. And where do you find treasure? You find treasure in, in NFTs, or you find st social status on social media, your treasure, your attention, your time, and increasingly your wealth and your access to real real goods that you require in order to feed your flawed vessel are all to be found in the virtual environment. But so few people are going to be able to actually own that. Increasingly, people are going to be tenants of these digital spaces subject to the terms and conditions of those systems. And we understand this already. I mean, like we understand how much of our identity, our time and our access to market is dependent on the sort of the sort of low tier digital platforms that we have to access yeah. our route to market through the big tech companies and and people speak a lot about social media platforms but the the what's getting closer to your point is what's happening at the deepest stack level and just how few companies actually own isps and literal internet internet access it's the same point but it's rolled out that much more in that you're talking about almost like a, a ubiquitous kind of like a wi-fi curtain that sort of closes around people where your entire life is built around a particular platform that has incredible economies of scale and efficiency. So it just doesn't make sense to sort of break these things down into smaller pockets of ownership. It only makes sense to have a, an accessible metaverse that has bridges built between platforms, but that of course just sort of increases the, the size of the sort of the oligarchy that's going to run these platforms that we spend our time and build our treasure and our future sort of identities within and that comes with a huge amount of power and that's and that's what you're alluding to there the who owns the substrate who wins the game wins and they win very big to sort of riff off your, your previous president you know winners win big in, in this sort of world and they're very few winners in this sort of world and what is also interesting is that it's global it's not based neatly onto geography so sort of so, talk about sort of 4d geopolitics it's playing out right now and that if you really want to control the future, you have to have to control all the different layers. You have to control the substrate you're talking about, but you also have to control the physical world and money flows, which are increasingly cryptographic or central bank digital currencies that fit into this, these digital platforms. And you also have to control the narratives and the stories that are being told around these things. So when you sort of control all four of those layers, the substrate is a, is a, is a 4D experience that, that one, one king will rule them all. It doesn't make sense to have 
many different sort of substrates. You have to control all the layers and the layers are global and borderless, which, which should be quite frightening for, for anyone that's interested in geopolitical rollouts. But what we have not necessarily seen is terrestrial leaders understanding the stakes that are playing out in the invisible substrate that transcends borders, much like the sort of virtual human experience transcends our physical realm, it transcends borders too. And that's why the sort of plays you make in, in terms of controlling that, whether that's controlled by private interests or by certain regional political powers, become very, very complicated very, very quickly and very, very high stakes. And that sort of leads to the next big question that I wanted to get into with you today as to what's happening with, the, with those players at the moment. From your perspective, in terms of who's going to end up as being the most likely kingmaker in this ubiquitous sort of platform yeah. substrate environment that we are increasingly virtualizing ourselves into, who are the likely poles of power and who from your perspective are currently winning the race? And you could look at this in terms of current nation states or in terms of corporate interests, because let's be honest, there's certain corporate platforms that already exist yeah, yeah. in the space that are bigger than several nation states on the world, in the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, uh, I, I think that you know, it's interesting to see how things are going to play out in the West. I think just to, to riff on a little bit of what you said there and then fly right into the question. I, I do think that there's there's a possibility of some kind of, you know, layered experience. You know, I imagine a future not terribly long from now where we'll kind of live almost in husks of sorts. You know, we'll have kind of our virtual experience that will be the bulk of, you know, um, uh, our interactions with friends, certainly almost all of our interactions with colleagues. Um, you know, our, our entertainment, our education, uh, et cetera. Um, and, then, and then we'll have the physical world. And that when we're in that husk, it's, it's entirely, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's entirely immersive experience. And I would presume that to your point, the ideal, and, and I suspect it is the ideal, would be for one party to rule them all, one group or an organization, whatever it is, to just sort of run that show. Because if you run that show, that's it. Um, you know, there, there really isn't competition if people are living in your reality, literally, um, like, like non-figuratively are living in the reality that you pipe into their faces uh, or, or the back of their, their heads. Um, it may be the case that in the States, there's um, a sort of layered or variety of that experience where certainly Facebook didn't buy Oculus for no reason. So I think some VR innovations, when that becomes popular, when people hang out with their friends by just kind of going into VR, when it gets to that level where it's viable there, when it gets to the level where actually it becomes viable for work collaboration, which is really when I think um, the traction uh, will kick in, when it's pragmatically beneficial, when you can make more money and have a uh, be, be more productive in, in your role when you adopt the technology, then I think we're, we're all getting into VR when that goes down. Um, I, I don't really care that much about gaming. I don't follow gaming. I don't care at all about gaming. I, I think gaming is interesting for building technology and then I'm interested in how it plays out in like power in the real world. Um, but so I think it, it might be possible that, you know, you'll have your Facebook land for these things. Maybe you'll virtual shop with Amazon. Um, you know, NVIDIA as a chip maker, I think is a really important player. So Google, Amazon, um, uh, Facebook, and, and in, in the States, I, I think NVIDIA is actually a pretty major player in terms of uh, owning the substrate. At the very end of the day, I think, I think that the main power, that the name of the game in the deepest sense, as far as I can tell, is the hardware that houses the experience itself. Now, again, that may be split. When you're in Facebook's world, you're in their house, right? You're in their little, little cube floating in the cloud somewhere. When you're shopping on Amazon, you're in their cube, or you're watching movies on Amazon, you're in their cube. You know, they've got physical substrates. But, but ultimately, it's where do you spend most of your time? What, what, what computer is running the most uh, like human reality uh, projections uh, at, at one time? So in, in the States, I, I think it might be might end up being pretty splintered. It's tough to say. I'd say on the aggregate, um, China, I think, kind of gets it more than than we do. Um, you know, you mentioned to, to terrestrial leaders. <laughs> that's a good way to put it. Uh, do terrestrial leaders understand what's going on? Um, you know, I don't think there's a reason if, if you've got to win votes. I don't think there's a reason to talk about this stuff because there isn't enough of a preponderance of the the the. Uh, you know, the voting body that, that, that cares at all, even a lick about this stuff. And Andrew Yang gave it a good crack. And I say, you know, good for him. 
Um, and, and, you know, maybe he'll come back. But, but I, I think that this stuff is just not a big enough deal uh, for most people. But I think in China, you know, where, where you don't really vote so much, um, uh, they can kind of cast their eyes forward um, a, a good deal better than we can. And I think have a, a much more um, sort of informed take on how to wield the digital ecosystem. You know, right now as it stands, you can see Chinese Communist Party propaganda on uh, Twitter, on YouTube, entire channels just spun up, you know, by CCP, you know, media, like, like uh, unabashed. It's just like, yes, like we are, we are owned by the Chinese Communist Party and we're gonna talk smack about America and its social justice issues. And we're gonna tell you how happy the Uyghurs are and that there's definitely not a million of them in camps and we're definitely not sterilizing the women um, and, 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 and killing the men. Um, and so that they can just, they can just breathe life into our permeable digital ecosystem, whatever messages they want to have us fight amongst themselves or, or to project the right image of themselves. And then they can also breathe the proper image of what they want onto their own people. When there's VR in China, people will be able to be immersed in pure Xi Jinping thought, you know, whatever the Maoist, you know, little red book equivalent is or whatnot, they'll be able to be fully enmeshed in that and, and bended and blended into the kind of harmony um, that, that that authoritarian regime um, uh, uh, sort of is, is depicting. And so I, I suspect that already any private company in China of sufficient size is essentially a wing of the Chinese Communist Party on one level or another. Um, and they can just take out the leaders whenever they want, right? Like, no matter what Biden does, like he can't just like uh, take Elon Musk and just like lock him up, you know what I mean? But but if but if you're Jack Ma, Lord knows, you know, um, Jack Ma might be dead already. Jack Ma might be getting his teeth knocked in the back of his throat while we're talking right now. But who, who, it's China, man. That, that's how it goes. So um, so I think that they are going to be able to enmesh the digital ecosystems genuinely into one stack. And there's one party that rules that stack. And there's one way to run that show. And there's one game plan to run that show. And already now, you know, it used to be they were keeping out Google and Facebook. They still do, of course. Um, but now they're getting TikTok in over here. And, and Lord knows, you know, what other kinds of hardware stuff. And Lord knows whatever kind of software stuff. And we're too busy fighting amongst ourselves to, to even conceivably give even the smallest shred of care. Uh, to that dynamic at all. But I think the name of the game for China would be let us fight amongst ourselves, continue to expand and eke out digital influence, software, hardware, um, be the place where more and more people live, certainly start with your own people, own their experience, um, you know, interfere with the permeable experiences of all these Western worlds. It'll just let you in whenever you want to go in um, and then gradually creep your way to, to broader power. So I, I don't see it congealing in the States anytime soon, across the West anytime soon. In China, I think it's already the name of the game. And I think they're vastly ahead of us uh, in, in terms of being able to run the digital show uh, and, and to, to run, in, in, to some regards, the post-human trajectory uh, uh, because they kind of get it on that level. Um, and and that, that certainly troubles me, but that's my general take. Yeah, but in general, that makes a lot of sense because they, they are the only player that has been playing that sort of 40 geopolitics game from my perspective. When I look at these sort of big things that are going on in the world, because you're talking about the, the tech stack layer there, but you've also got the money layer there. The digital yuan is way ahead of other currencies. And this is how you tie it all together. You tie it all together by having a virtual currency for a virtual environment and a completely surveilled physical space. So China owns the full stack of the husk. It really does. Whereas other players simply don't. Exactly. So when you sort of connect your thesis together, what's going on in the world of like, you know, digital currencies and the huge surveillance potential that comes with that and all those sorts of those sorts of things, you tie it together and you've got an environment that people not just can't leave, but also people don't want to leave. And I think that this leads more into your point. And this is something that a lot of Westerners don't understand. That people in China, many of them are very happy to be there. I know people that are fine with it because they get what they, they need out of the system. Who cares if you don't have physical freedom, if your treasure is stored in the virtual world and you are winning at that game and you have everything that you want. The layer that China is missing right now is the virtual layer. As much as you can say that a lot of the sort of propaganda coming out of them and the sort of message control is in some degrees virtualized or at least yeah, not yeah. entirely, you know, empirically true. The actual virtual stack isn't there yet, but that's sort of the layer that, that is materializing. That's as the medium with which we connect 
to our virtual world goes beyond a sort of 2D screen, as you're saying, towards a more 3D experience and ultimately towards being able to plug your, your body directly into that system 24 seven, whether that's through some sort of brain neuro interface, whether it's through even just something like a contact lens or anything that messes yep. around with your senses in a, in a full, full experience continually will change where you live. And then of course, reality becomes optional rather than the other way around. So they are very, very close to that. All they're sort of waiting for is, as you say, kind of the sort of hardware to catch up with the system that they've already built. And no one else has built that, that fully layered system where you control the terrestrial environments, you can control people's actual movements in the physical world, which you can. I mean, they've got the facial recognition, they've got the gait recognition, the voice oh, yeah. recognition, that system oh, yeah. set up. You've got the monetary system, it's fully digital, fully, fully integrated into that. You layer on the virtual experience and, and you're kind of ready to go. That should be very frightening for sort of powers looking in and out, people that haven't understood the new game that is being played around it. And as you mentioned, that it's it's an evangelical movement too, in that it's not staying within the, the terrestrial borders. They've got the they've got different apps and different networks, and we've got 5G and we've got TikTok and we've got all these wonderful things that are sort of spreading that that version of reality to a, to a larger part of the world without violence it's it's a different sort of conflict right so that sort of brings me to the next point you've mentioned that america at least we still have innovation in places like america it might not be a controlled strategy but they actually have some pretty big players in the game i'm saying they because i don't obviously live in, sure, in america sure. But you've got a lot of those, those very big, deep stack companies like your Amazons and your Facebooks and your Googles that even though they don't necessarily have the permission or the, the backing of a violent force, which China does have on its side, which these companies or these, these sort of these, these digital states essentially have, yeah. they do have already monetary layers built in. They do have virtual layers built in. They do have huge adoption in terms of time and attention on an international level, once again. So you could say that at least they have come out of the Western house and though they, they do have a couple of horses in that particular race. But there's also the other view that I know that you've written about quite a lot and that's there's sort of two ways to, to deal with change and that's either to sort of innovate or to, or to regulate or to do a bit of both. So China's kind of doing a bit of both, right? So they're, they're innovating but under a regulated environment. So then you've got the sort of the Western wild horsemen that are sort of running a bit unbridled through, the, through towards the future. But then you've got the sort of European perspective, which has been to take quite a different approach. And I know you've written about it, so I don't want to sort of put your words in your mouth. So do you want to yeah, take over yeah. from there? The innovation versus sure, regulation sure. debate. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, uh, I, I'll give a couple dynamics on this. So I think that if, if AI is to be the big game, if, if the post-human trajectory and sort of the, the great power dynamics of the future are going to be discerned by this technology, then um, you'd want to get in on it. Uh, in fact, maybe, maybe you'd want to control it. Now, I don't say that, right? You want to say things like benevolent. You want to, you want to deny your own canatus and frame it as benevolence because that's what um, any intelligent person or, or organization would do. But, but you know, you'd, want to, you'd want to have your hands on it for sure. If it's going to be the future of, of power, that's, that's what you want to do. Um, and if you, can, if you can build the tech and, and pull ahead with it, well, then that would be the obvious first way to do it. I mean, you would just, you would just build a technology, you would pull ahead and then that would be, uh, that would be the name of the game. You would innovate your way into having this stuff in your hands. If you can't do that, then you would want to uh, regulate it so that even if there are big companies that are, that are innovating, um, you would be able to actually ultimately wield some control over them. Uh, and, and be more important, more powerful, ultimately sort of the bigger gatekeeper, kingmaker, uh, whatever it is, uh, influencer of the trajectory than even the innovators themselves. Um, and, and I think that there's really kind of two paths. Those, those are really the only two main paths to sort of grabbing a hold of the bull here is, is you know, can we be the ultimate arbiter in the regulatory sense or can we race ahead farthest in the, in the innovation sense? And it's almost like the Robespierre and the, the Bonaparte thing. Like, like if you do have, you know, uh, legions, you know, if, if you have lieutenants, if you can march on the, 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 the building, you know, you'll, you'll just take it, you know, and, and then, and then you'll, you'll run, you can run France like that. You just do it that way. I mean, in fact, it's kind of like the logical way to pull it off if you can do it. Now, if you can't, then you got to Robespierre it. You got to, you got to be the good little guy. You got to stand up for the underdogs and talk about how, 
you know, um, they're not being represented and you ultimately stand for them. Again, you can't frame your canatus. Frankly, it has to always be feigned in benevolence. I'm sure Bonaparte told them they were marching across the mountains, you know, uh, whether into Italy or into Russia or whatever, you know, in the name of France or some virtuous thing other than, you know, in the name of my own glory, right? Everybody, you got to couch it in something. And Robespierre certainly couched it in many things. Um, but, you know, you got to play the, the um, you know, we should all be virtuous. We should look out for everybody game. Now, it's not to say that every innovator is at the end of the day, some evil, ravenous, terrible entity. I'm not saying that, nor am I saying everybody who thinks about AI ethics is, you know, secretly trying to lop off heads with a guillotine. But I am saying at the end of the day, everybody's self-interested and that you're going to take whatever approach makes sense, right? It's like, all the, you know, the, the, the Swiss were so virtuous in World War II. It's like, I'm not really sure. It's like, it could have just been, if they picked either side, a lot more of them would have died and their economy would have been disrupted all the more. And so it made sense from raw, brutal self-interest to be neutral. I, I think most of our positions come from just absolutely brutal self-interest, just gruesome tooth and nail self-interest. And it manifests in whatever form it is. Happy go friendly AI ethics, or uh, rough and tumble AI innovation, whatever the case may be. So Europe is pretty clearly not gonna be winning the innovation game. Now, I'm not, I'm not frowning on Europe. Um, I, I'm not like against Europe, but they're, they're not pumping Googles out. And I don't think they're gonna be anytime soon. I don't think they even really want to anytime soon. I think they've kind of almost intentionally handed on the baton of, of sort of like grandeur. I think that they're, they're sort of welcoming that the decline from that. Um, but, but man, it sure would suck to be left all the way behind. So I think regulation is, is sort of the name of the game. And, and really, what else could they compete in? You know, if they if they can take a portion of the world and maybe extend it out to more of the world and say, hey, you got to play by our rules. Well, maybe they can structure those rules so they don't far, fall behind as much, right? Because otherwise, Google will, in some ways, predatorily, just gobble up their data, gobble up their money and pump it all over to the States or to Ireland or wherever the hell they all keep their money um, and, and wherever they wire it through. Uh, and, and so that they'll want to at least have control of it, over it in that sense. The issue is, and I'll, I'll kind of pass it back to you on this front. Um, the issue is that we've got to consider the, the Western world in, in, this, in this regard, I think, wholly ignores the fact that there's a, the, the remainder of the international order here, namely sort of the Chinas and Russias of the world. We're kind of playing around as if who can be the most fair, who can be the most good, who can be the most virtuous, um, who can be the most inclusive. And there's nothing inherently wrong with that, but there is something wrong with that if, it's, if it, if it um, literally casts away even the very notion of any strength or maintenance of predominance in technology, given the other players in the game. I think the West um, believes that freedom of, of, of association, of, of uh, information, of, of, of speech, of whatever, um, is actually in the air. I think they just believe like, like it's, it's, it's in the ether. It always has been. Oh, all these freedoms, these are, these are, these, they're, they're eternal. They're eternal freedoms. They exist everywhere in all directions. Um, but actually, they only exist sort of because regimes that are strong enough to uphold them actually uphold them. If you go to Shanghai, you can test your freedoms out and you can see how that goes for you. Whether you're Jack Ma or you're Joe Schmo, um, your, your teeth can be in the back of your throat right quick um, and, and, and they done won't know where you went. And so, uh, so we're, we're at this tough point where the West, as far as I can tell, in this digital game that we're rolling into that you and I have been, have been articulating, the West has to figure out two things. How do we uphold the values that, you know, we don't want to let go of, right? We don't want to become China. And the unfortunate thing is they're kind of setting the pace now. That's bothersome but we don't want to become China. So how can we uphold our values? Certainly all of our freedoms, inclusiveness, you know, uh, alleviating bias is great. And how can we maintain our strength and predominance? Period, straight up hardcore period. Because, because if we are to pretend as though these values matter, we have to pretend as though we can be strong enough to uphold them in an international order. At least within our own boundaries, people can be damn free. You know, whether you're at an NBA game or not, you could talk about the Uyghurs if you want to. Um, and, and uh, you know, uh, all, all, already that stuff is being infringed on. So, um, so I think that's, that's the, the crux that we're at. And I think the Western world honestly is wholly ignoring that. And they're more playing a, you know, who can be cooler in a virtue and inclusion sense. I think that's great. I think the impetus is strong, but can we, can we optimize for both? And to be honest, I don't know if we can.
Yeah, exactly. And we still was talking about early days here. I mean, like what we're talking about now in terms of the sort of players on the board, we're still talking about human players playing very, yeah. very human games, yep, like like exactly. current version human games. Harmony and games. I think of it perhaps what we don't don't fully understand is that how quickly the next level up happens and and then suddenly the human games don't don't even feature anymore. So, you know, like once once the sort of the husk has been transcended and you start talking about sort of, you know, post-human intelligence, None of none of these sort of positions or any sort of board matters anymore. Whoever whoever is first past the post sort of takes all. That's the sort of the super intelligence thesis, right? I mean, there can only be one super intelligence at the end of the day. The final, <laughs> it's not really a, not really a democratic proposition when you get to, when you get to sort of post human intelligence. And I suppose that's that's probably the, the way we have to sort of bring this conversation back because that's how we started out. So so let's let's leave China in the Western Europe. And unfortunately for us in Africa, we don't we don't have a dog in this fight. I mean, like not this, yet. This, no, no. This this, this, this game is playing out around us. Like we've missed mm-hmm. this, we get one in pretty quickly. There's there's an awful lot of catching up. I mean, our choices yeah. generally are I have I've had these sort of conversations around geopolitics before, more about who we align with rather than sort of what we what we that's do exactly by it. ourselves. That's exactly it. Yeah. Yep. So so Africa's got a choice to align with the various different sort of players that we've spoken about today. But in in terms of in terms of where we headed, there there suddenly those sort of competitions fall by eventually fall by the wayside when we sort of roll this conversation out far enough ahead. And that's whatever comes next in terms of the next sort of evolution of intelligence. And I know you've written about this and spoken about this too, that that you know higher intelligence has a has a higher moral claim as to gets gets to play sort of God here on our little terrestrial planets. Like this is why we get to rule over the lesser intelligences of other different animals and plants in the sort of natural world around us. So whoever wins the game still has to win the game understanding that they're going to have to sort of hand that baton over to whatever comes next. And I think that maybe maybe you've got a few comments there in terms of your thoughts there, because I do think they're quite interesting to sort of end this 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 off with a way just to sort of scare people even more in terms of why that is that is a noble goal to get to a point where where we sort of leave ourselves behind for whatever whatever comes next. Yeah, yeah, whatever comes next. Yeah, I, I think look, you know, and again, like I said, my position is is certainly never been a foolhardy rushing to post human intelligence if it took hundreds of years and that that seemed by all rational accounts best, I, I, I suspect I'd be more than open to that. But, but I do think that um, there is a lot of talk, even from folks who I have a tremendous amount of respect for, who have uh, you know, even more experience thinking uh, about these things and writing books about these things than I do. But there's a lot of talk around sort of these um, uh, technologies always being used as a tool and all future permutations of intelligence always being equals. Um, and I think this is really, I mean, if I wanna be harsh, I think it's childish. I think it's shamefully childish to presume. Um, and, and, and I think it's dangerous to presume because I think that if, so if we take you know, chimpanzees, people, I, I don't know what um, measurements we wanna take. These are very abstract, subjective things, but let's just pretend we could measure things like, creativity, self-understanding, you know, language capacity, ability to leverage tools, whatever we want to do, line up 30 of them, I don't know, whatever ones you want to do, whatever ones make us different from monkeys, just line them all up and then, and then look at relative scores. Um, and, then, and then do those and then look at all of our scores and then level them up by the same amount to let's say some post-human entity V1. Um, to think that said entity would, would you know, line up in queue and vote its one vote uh, the same as, as, uh, as, the, as the hairless apes um, is, is really, really, really a dumb idea. Um, and I think that we have to accept that if we are to create things that are vastly greater to we as we are to, to the lower animals, and I have plenty of respect for the lower animals, I, I, I don't have any meat in my home, I, you know, I, I, I you know, I, I, I do my best in, in that regard and in, in the, the, the animal welfare thing. Although I don't pretend that the end of factory farming would end the fact that, um, you know, the huge bulk of animals are going to die kicking and screaming, being e- eaten alive. I think the Darwinian problem is much bigger than the human created problem there, but regardless, um, fully respectful of, of, uh, of animals and intelligence of all kinds from octopi to dolphins to you name it. But, but, 
the, yeah, yeah the, the, the Occupy aren't voting. And, and, and we wouldn't damn well let them. We wouldn't let them and we shouldn't let them. And, and whatever is beyond us, it would be ridiculous to presume would be on equal moral grounds with us. If it's, so again, us to monkeys, right? Let's just say I, I come up with a couple, self-understanding, creativity, emotional uh, and sentient range, right? Goods and bads that we can experience in a utilitarian scale. Whatever, whatever differentiating factors, if we just level them all up one more tap from humans to say, no, 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 but actually moral value stays really even right here. It, Homo sapiens actually is the highest peak. There's actually nothing above that is obscene. It's obscene. And so we have to understand as part of the danger, um, uh, but in my opinion, part of the, just, just the rational consideration that if we are to continue this trajectory, we have to be willing to make that handoff. And that may make us want to be, you know, uh, pr pretty, pretty careful about the paths that we choose. Um, so it's going to be a tough road ahead, but I, I, I really think that the happy go friendly post human intelligences singing kumbaya together ball game, uh, is, is, is not the game we're entering here. Yeah, so you've got to be very, very careful about whose hands we allow to, to sort of build and direct that transition as we go ahead, which yeah. comes back to your point that we, we really do have to be paying attention to the people that do have dogs in the fights and horses in the race right now, because likely we're already so far down this, this track. It's someone that's already in the ring or at least, at least a group or an entity or a, or a national directive that already has some sort of say and sway that it is most likely is following the most sort of probable course as to who gets to shape out this next stage of the transition. And we definitely want to make sure that it's, we've got more, at least, at least if not benevolent, at least not downright malevolent players in the game. As you were talking about there in terms of innovation and regulation, I mean, we, we, you can't blame someone or the weak for, for wanting to impose virtue upon the strong. Sure, <laughs> at the same sure. time, sure. you can't really you know, blame the strong for, for taking advantage of their strength. Oh, no. But in the same time, we can at least hope that people are acting with not, with not more than self-interest and hopefully at least sort of align ourselves and our sort of general feature because it involves all of us. It's, not, it's, it's a general human project. Yeah. It's, not a, it's not a regional discussion that we're having right now that we can at least sort of support with our, our votes, our time, our money, and our choices as to sort of which platforms we start to log on to now and which way we compound and compile our virtual treasure is hopefully in a place that we want to be going into the future. That's about the most sort of encouraging way that I can I can see this playing out. I don't know if you have any more thoughts there. That's a that's a really great point to end on here. Um, and I, you know, I, I would concur with one of the points you made that you can't really blame. I don't think you can ever really blame self interest. Um, it's troubling. It's not to say that I don't think we should have laws that punish people. I'm not saying that, but I think the best that we have for the future is aligning incentives. It's really really hard to read history. Uh, it's really, really, a God, is it hard to read history and then to say, you know, we just need to, you know, it's like the good, like we just need the good people to be in power. You know what I mean? Like it's just, it's just too hard for me. I just can't, I can't find epochs. I can't go to China. I can't go to Egypt. I can't, I can't read any of the damn books and feel that way. I can only feel that the best we have is aligning incentives. And, and this is why I'm extremely wary of any parties that pretend um, to, to stand as saints because I think I think that that's that's exactly how you how you try to turn it into some other dynamic than that. That's exactly how you try to wield an inordinate amount of power for yourself. I think the best that we can say is, "Hey, nations, countries, individuals, we're all after our own stuff. What's a way of structuring this where none of us can get each other's, you know, uh, take each other's lunch here too much, um, and we can all kind of move a little bit farther forward in ways that make sense? And what's a transparent way of setting this up where we could all be as happy with it as we damn well can be?" knowing that we don't all have the same incentives uh, here. And I think aligning incentives in, in a full-blown frank understanding of our, of our relative self-interest, in many regards, what the origin of the UN was, is about as good as we could do for the transition ahead. And I, I hope we do something akin to that. Exactly, aligning incentives that work with and not against human nature, any incentive that's, that attempts to, to divert human nature or to, or to change it inevitably runs into terrible, terrible consequences that we don't necessarily think through. We understand this all too well. I mean, we all, we all know exactly how, how good intentions run amok. We have yeah. to work with, with the, the creatures that we are, the flawed, the flawed, flawed creatures that we are. And we have to, we have to as you say, follow that self-interest rather than trying to resist it because there's always an incentive to renege as soon as you try and build an artificial 
equilibrium around around these sorts of grand messy problems that involve absolutely everyone there is probably also a conversation to, to be had in that as we look a bit further down the line with this much like the issues involving climate change and other sorts of wicked entire planetary problems that ultimately we all sort of dealing with the same problem here it's not a it's not a conflict between one group of humans and the next it's a conflict between all of us and where we are headed that is directed by some some groups and not by others but the consequences are going to be felt by all even if there are winners in the short term yeah yeah I, I can I can agree with that in a big way yeah so unless you have any closing comments there I'm just going to ask you to let people know where they can find you if they want to get hold of you continue the conversation if you want to be found of course some of us yeah, don't want to be sure days. sure yeah I'm not uh I'm not totally uh under underground these days um yeah it's just just at Dan Fagel on Twitter or emerj.com is the name of the website or um danfagella.com is where the blogs are about the much farther along stuff the stuff you and i riff about uh bronwyn is is on my my personal site so danfagella.com or just at danfagella feel free to be in touch let me know you heard about me through this conversation i'm happy to catch up uh this is this is the big game stuff this is stuff i'm most excited to chat about so i'd welcome it yeah, this is just an intro conversation. I highly recommend checking out both of Dan's websites there, Emerge and danfagella.com. Very interesting stuff to be found, whether you are interested in the future of your business or the future of the human species at large. But thanks so much for your time, Dan. Appreciate it, Bronwyn.